Hi, this is Kate Olson, and we're here on the Soul Fire Radio website, and we're about to do a soul talk. And this soul talk uh, I'm having with Hera Allison, and we're going to talk about vulnerability. And this is a topic that I've wanted to um, talk about for quite a while, but I couldn't find somebody um, brave enough to do it. And Hera thankfully has volunteered. So I'd like to have her introduce herself before we get started with the talk. Hi, Hera. Hi, my name's Hara Allison and um... I'm a graphic designer with Studio H Creative and a photographer for Howard Allison Photography. And I'm about to start my own podcast called See Beneath Your Beautiful. Yeah, and that's, I interviewed her, I don't know, seems like just a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. and she'd never been interviewed before. So <laughs> she definitely is a lady who jumps right in. <laughs> yes, I, I'm definitely a lady who jumps right in. So, um, what do you, how do you see vulnerability? What do you think of when, when you bring up that? That's a very interesting question because just last year I was saying, I wrote on Facebook that I'd love to do a photo shoot and call it vulnerability. And my idea of vulnerability is beauty. It's um, being open. And what I got back was, so interesting people kept saying well i don't like my stomach it makes me very vulnerable i don't like the scar on my face i'm very vulnerable and you could take photos of that and i was like oh that is exactly the opposite of what i want to do like so it's so interesting how people view vulnerability because i see it as you're willing to be beautiful and willing to love yourself despite that scar on your face and despite that you have a big stomach, who cares? So that, I just thought that was so interesting that people are really scared of, uh, of the word vulnerability. I mean, all they did was think negative and I was just thinking how, how beautiful they could be. Well, I think um, people feel like vulnerability um, leaves you open to attack. Yes. And I think of it, uh, you know, have you seen that uh, posting where they show the Japanese art where um, something that's broken is glued back together oh, and yeah, then I, they uh, paint it with gold, gold mm -hmm. and it, it's beautiful art, um, but, you know, it it's made from something that's been broken or been vulnerable. Last year, and out of a, that comes the beauty. Last year, I did a self-portrait series when COVID started. And one of my photos is me with painted gold lines and that word across on my arm. I can't remember the word. It starts with a K. And I think that's my point exactly, that we are, who's not broken? Who's I mean, we all have something. Nobody's perfect. It's interesting that we would even still think so. Um, the other day I was thinking it's not body positivity. It's not body neutrality that I'm promoting. It's just body. It's just, we just have, we're just so lucky to have a body. Who cares its shape? I mean, you should take care of it. But the fact that we put so much emphasis of who we are on what we look like or that scar on our face or whatever. It's so interesting to me. And I find all those things so beautiful. It's what makes us unique. Um, yes, and it's it's not just body, it's it's all of us. Right, well, and the it's, shame. E even though the outside is what we sometimes feel most vulnerable about, mm -hmm. um, one of our greatest quests in life is to be known. Mm -hmm. Yes. But most of us hide because we're afraid, you know, if people do really see that inside that, you know, they, they won't like it, they won't accept it. Yeah. But we can't, we won't, we can't be known unless we do, you know, mm -hmm. come out. There 
of that. There's a special on right now or a documentary about the about Dylan Farrow, who accuses Woody Allen of touching her when she was little, his daughter, and she was seven. And I was touched in the same way by um, a family member. No, sorry, not a family member. That's very inaccurate. A member, a, a friend of the family. That's, that's what it was. Anyway, and I told my mother and she didn't believe me. Mm-hmm. And the shame I had until just a couple of years ago, um, you know, I was seven and I didn't say no very loudly. And a little part of me, which was the shame of it, appreciated the attention because I'm the youngest of six. And so it was in, until, and, and I mean, I'm just going to be complete. This is, this is, this was the shame and my body responded and the horror of that, that I, all those things together. And finally, um, a counselor a couple years ago, finally talked about it. And she said that your body's supposed to respond. That's what your body's made to do. I mean, I, I and, and I was seven, like, and I think about a seven year old, but I, I held on to a grown up's thought that I should have said no loudly, I should have got right up. So we hold on to these shameful things. And as soon as I talked about that experience and let go of the shame, which I had been holding on for so many years, I mean, seven to 51 or something, I was free. I was free yeah. to love myself. And that's the, the reason I want to always have these deep conversations, because I think if we can get rid of that shame, then we're, we really do live a life that's more, much more full. Yes, definitely. And um, there's so many things that children take in that, um, you know, nobody stops to explain, like, you know, they hear you're supposed to say no, right? Nobody says that that isn't the child's responsibility. Right. And it, it is unfortunate that your mother wasn't able to believe you. Or if she did, you know, honestly, after thinking about it, she might have believed me, but we were in a house with six. She was a single mom with six children and it might have just been too much to handle. And so, yeah. but that is where um, I found my lack of self-worth. And that's why everything changed when I learned to comfort that little seven-year-old and love her and be the parent to her and tell her it was okay. Um, my mom couldn't do it and that's totally okay. It's, it's too bad, but it wasn't, she wasn't equipped. But learning to love that little girl, I constantly talk about little Hara and I couldn't say that a few years ago I couldn't say little Hara without like rolling my own eyes at myself like you know get over it be you know but that little girl needs so much love and it's okay to be vulnerable and needy and want somebody to stroke your hair and to be broken like we were talking about you know I I am is I'm broken and I you you weren't really broken you were dealing with the situation the best that you could at the time. Yes, I exactly. had a client who, like you, had that experience as a child. And it was actually, it was a family member. It was mm. her father. Mm. And uh, she believed, too, that she was broken. And uh, she actually developed some coping mechanisms that were they turned out to be negative for her it was um pulling out her hair and eyebrows and everything uh and that's what she actually came to me to resolve and she thought well, you know, look at me, I'm such a mess, I have to do this, because this happened. And, you know, but she used what she had available to comfort herself at the time. Right. And she got through that. 
She also, her mom couldn't help her because she was drug addicted and she got through all of that with a few coping mechanisms that, that turned out to be negative, but as an adult, she could get past those. Yeah. And so she wasn't really broken. She was resourceful. Right. And thank you for saying that. We were talking about the, the Japanese bowl. So I said broken, but I don't think, I just think if all that didn't happen, I wouldn't be me today. I mean, I have no, you know, we are, we have this path. And it's, if we can just realize, I was telling my daughter the other day, she was saying something about something stressful in her life. And I was like, you know, it's really just a movie and you're just watching it. I mean, if you could just really watch it instead of like feeling like you have to be completely in control and write, you know, direct the script this way and that way and take a step back, it's really much, um, much easier. And it's gonna play out the way it's gonna play out anyway. Well, also when we watch a movie we have a lot of compassion and empathy for those people in that movie. Yes. If we could do that for ourselves, yes, you know, it would work out so much better. Right. Well, and I say, I always tell somebody if they have a daughter, it's really easy to understand how to love yourself. Because if you can just imagine how kind you would be to your daughter, no matter what she did, she, my, I mean, my daughters cannot do anything, literally anything that would make me not love them. And, and I owe it to myself to love me the same way because I'm the one with me all the time. I'm, I mean, I'm with me till the very end. And so by being loving to me and also being loving to me, boy, can I be loving to others because I'm not comparing, I'm not wishing, I'm not being envious. I'm just, I'm in, I'm in love with what I've created and I'm, I'm proud of myself for, you know, I'm here I am and, um, it allows me to be emp empower others to be who they are and, you know, supporter and, and lift up because there's, there's literally no envy. Right. And it's those unspoken hurts that we keep inside the wounds, um, that continue to hurt us. Like you said, once you speak it. Once you say it and let it out, and usually you do get the response from other people of, yes, I had that happen too. Yes, I felt that way as well. Or even if they didn't, you know, it's like, you know, I can imagine how hurtful that was. Right, right. There's a sent uh, quote that I can't remember verbatim, but it says, once you know somebody's story, you can't help but love them. And I think that's so true. And that's the, you know, that's why I'm so drawn to doing a podcast and talking to women about their stories. One woman said to me, I want to do your podcast, but, and, and I know her, I know she has a lot to say, but she said, I don't know why anybody would think I'm interesting enough. And I said, you know, even if, I mean, it's so interesting that she's already putting herself down and I'm saying your story's wonderful because it's your story. I don't care where it goes or what happened or what didn't happen, what you think should have happened. Your story is beautiful because it's your story. Just like she's beautiful because she's beautiful. She won't do a photo shoot because she doesn't think she's beautiful enough. And it's so, I think it's so sad because I see it and I wish I could show it to her. Like she's so, um, very down on herself about, oh, well, my life's not interesting enough. I'm not pretty enough. But of course we are. Everyone yeah. is, is unique. And it is, I, I totally understand her because as yeah. I told you before, I spent years of saying no photos, mm -hmm. but you know, it, photographers all the time, what they do is they record life. They just record life. They don't decide this is beautiful and so I'm going to take pictures of it. Sometimes they do, but mostly they're just recording what is. And what is becomes beautiful. 
right. Oh, that's really beautiful. Do you know, um, I remember a long time ago when I, you know, I've, I've been, I've been fighting weight forever and I remember, I can't remember if somebody told me or it occurred to me that me being so self-absorbed with my weight was actually egotistical that I was, it was all about ego, even though I didn't like what I looked like. It was just all about me, all about me, all about me, because nobody cares but me. And so I think that's a real grace when you can just say it's the body and live your life and it's and, and take get to, it's ego. If we can if she's so, if she's worried about she's not interesting enough, that's ego. Like I have to make sure somebody finds me interesting enough that my story's here instead of where it actually is, or I'm not pretty enough. I just think it's so interesting how we let our ego sort of run the rule the day. And even when you're unhappy with yourself, it's so interesting that that's ego because it would feel like it's the opposite. Well, it, it can be ego. Sometimes it's, you know, lack of that essential self-esteem, that feeling of self-worth. Yeah. Um, but in order to heal those things that, you know, like, okay, maybe you've been struggling with weight, well, you're never going to let go of that weight forever until you accept it. Right. Well, that's very true. Yeah. Well, and I can love myself without loving what yes. I what my, well, my you shape can is. Never lose the weight and still love yourself. But on a okay, if you decide you do want to lose the weight. You're going to struggle unless you accept and love yourself the way you are. Right. Like one thing for me was my skin broke out. I had, you know, acne till I was 50. Um, and I hid it in every way possible. And I hated it. And I scrubbed my face. And, and not knowing that it wasn't really coming from anything. Uh, I went to so many doctors. Um, and then I learned that it actually comes from your gut. But it wasn't until I could just let go of that hate that I had for, you know, the way I looked that... Right. I was able to clear it up. Right. Right. I always think about this one event that I went to. I mean, I had bought a new outfit and I mean, I was probably the same weight I am now. And I was sitting in my car, a friend was inside waiting for me. And I just thought I was too fat and I drove home. <laughs> I didn't even go in. And I just think about, you know, I've told you that my mom passed away at 46. I was 18. And to waste any moments, you know, on, on my, maybe my shirt was tight, whatever, you know, just, it's just, I feel like it's a crime. So. Well, when we think about, you know, like, uh, okay, I, you know, as I said, I didn't go places because, you know, my skin was too broke out. Yeah. <laughs> I canceled with friends, people that wanted to see me. Like mm -hmm. same as what you did. You yeah. didn't go someplace because you, you were thinking about you instead of um, the experience itself or yeah. the people you might be spending time with. Right. So I wonder, and, you know, the people inside the event didn't care what I looked like and your friends certainly didn't care. Well, they wanted to see you. Who cares what you look like, right? So that's all I'm saying is that. Well, that and the people that we, you know, think about the people you love, the people that, you know, make that impression on you that I just love this person. They're usually, it's, it's not because of how they look. It's because of how they make you feel. Right. It's never about, right. I mean, right. I can't think of anybody I love because they're beautiful. <laughs> you know, 
except my husband, but I love him for lots of other reasons too. <laughs> well, we might, we might love somebody. I mean, we might love the fact that somebody is beautiful. We might yeah, yeah. Because, appreciate, you yeah. know, especially if, if you're an aesthetic person, mm -hmm. but that at the core of it, isn't what we continue to love somebody for. We love them for their character, the things they do, and primarily because we feel good when we're around them. They That is right. Yeah, I love that. Right. So, so I guess for that to go to somebody else, I mean just and you and this is what I used to say, you know, you can't pretend to be somebody you're not anyway. I mean, for long, you, can, but you can't for long, work. you can't sustain it anyway, you can't sustain it. So you might as well just embrace who you are. There's only one of you. You're awesome. You know, that's, I just feel like I just wish I just wish we loved each, ourselves more because life is short. It's my it's my life's goal. I have a pin on my very expensive purse, my beautiful leather that I stuck a pin in, a, you know, a little thrift store pin that says be nice to you. But I just, that's what I just, you know, be nice to you. That's my, my life's, you know, if I could put a billboard out there. <laughs> yes. And, and especially when you hear yourself saying those things like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm too fat or I, my hair doesn't look good or mm -hmm. whatever it is that you're mm -hmm. saying to yourself, mm -hmm. think about you know, if your friend was saying that, right, most people are right. going to say, Oh, no, you're not or um, you look great today or whatever. Somebody told me the best story the other day that um, I'm going to be doing a retreat with another lady about loving yourself. And I spoke to somebody who does women's retreats. And she told me this exercise that she did where she had everybody write post-it notes of the mean things they say to themselves. And then they were supposed to write post-it notes, something loving on, the, on somebody else's back. But one person misunderstood and she thought she was supposed to put the hateful things she wrote onto other people. And mid-sentence said, I could never say that to them, but stopped herself mid-sentence thinking, oh, why am I saying it to myself? So the exercise, even though she messed up was so perfect. That was the best illustration. And I love that. Would you say any of the cruel things you say to somebody else? The answer is no. So one of my usually we're uh, reluctant to say the kind things that we say to other people to ourselves. You right. know, we feel like somehow it's, it's arrogant or, you know, right. I, right. And but, that is sometimes the hardest thing to do. You know, I've, had these exercises where I've, I've asked somebody to, you know, say one thing they like about themselves or give themselves a compliment. And it's just like really hard. <laughs> right. My daughter just did a piece of art for somebody and it's on there. They put it on a shirt and they're selling it. And she's so proud of herself. And she's like, I don't know what to write. And I was like, right. I'm awesome. Right. I'm great. I mean, I would write it. That's what, I mean, I have no problem but I, I think of when I, this is even what I do when I play tennis. And I play with a lot of women who are constantly beating themselves up when they play tennis. But I'm the little girl on the tennis court and I'm saying, good job. That was a great try. You know, the next point will be better if I miss that one or if I got it, oh my gosh, you're the greatest. I just, I'm just always that little girl. And I think we can easily compliment ourselves if we are that little girl that we, um, you know, we're. But I think that's what I said at the end. We're just still that precious little girl that somebody had at one point or the precious little boy. We just have to keep remembering that. Yes, I think that is one of the keys to um, finding that um, self-love and that person you, you want to be, even if you didn't get that as a child. Right, um, right. I think and I that's... did in pieces. Um, I did in pieces, but not, not. And so, right. So I'm just giving it to myself now. And boy, am I good at it. That's what I always say. I'm really good at loving myself. And 
it doesn't even seem it doesn't even seem weird anymore. It did in the beginning because how can I love myself? I'm 40, 50, 60 pounds overweight. You know, how dare you love yourself? But how dare I not? You know, I'm, I'm the, and, and the more I love, the more loving I am to myself, people can see that like, you know, I am so loving to my husband. As a matter of fact, we've been practicing with taping ourselves, you know, to see the, for the podcast. And I can, it's so cool to see how I talk to him and I listen to him and I look up to him. I just love our relationship because in my first marriage, you know, it was very, um, I didn't, didn't have, wasn't respectful. I was young. He was young. So it's just nice to be well, in a we, loving. We do have, have to love ourselves before we can really love somebody else. Right. Truly. I mean, so, sometimes we right. think we love somebody, but it's just that we don't know how. We want to love right. them, but we Right. Don't. And and so I I am apolog I mean not apologizing. I well, whatever. I I'm sorry for I I did not love myself as a young woman. And so my first husband had nowhere to go with that. And so yes. it's just, I'm just saying, it's very sweet to see that I love me and I love my husband. And it's a nice, yes, it's, a, I, it's nice I to see. totally understand that. I was very insecure uh, when I was married to my ex-husband. And it was to an extreme where I wanted him to make everything better. And you know, he wasn't capable of doing that. Well, and I realized a few years ago, um, if I couldn't love me, how could he possibly? Like that thought popped in my head. And and he was just, you know, when I, you know, well, he's my husband. He's supposed to love me no matter what. I didn't love me no matter what. And he's just really a boy in a grown man's well, body. I mean, the expectations. When you, when you don't love yourself, you're actually combative. You actually push the other mm. person away. Mm. You don't mean to because you want that love, but um, I- probably don't believe it if they say something nice anyway. Right. Um, I was so insecure. Um, like uh, if my ex-husband um, said something nice, I didn't believe him. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, it was, it was ridiculous. I, well, yeah. I would ask him if he thought somebody on TV was attractive. There was no right answer. <laughs> I mean, if he said they were attractive, then I would feel, oh, he thinks they're more attractive than me. If mm -hmm. he said they weren't attractive, oh, I don't believe you. Right. <laughs> you know? That's so interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it was ridiculous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, I did not even realize that I did that until after I was divorced and I was um, dating somebody. I was actually very briefly engaged to him who was as insecure as me. Mm. And it, it, it didn't matter. Uh, <laughs> You know what I said. There was no way I could make him feel secure. Right. It it was the same dynamic, and it made me kind of see myself. Mm -hmm. And I actually wrote a letter at that time to my ex husband and told him. I said, you know, hey, I didn't know how that felt. Right. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I did the same thing to my ex husband. I wrote him a, a letter and. Yeah, I apologized for, you know, ex I just, yeah, it was very interesting when the, it took, and it took 15, 20 years for that to yeah, even occur to me. Because, you know, you know, I always thought of myself, you know, as a nice person, mm -hmm. but, you know, I didn't know how it feels to somebody to get right. that when you're in right. a relationship. It just doesn't feel good at all. Right, right. So, yeah. So, well, that's the beauty of this life, I think, right? Is that everybody's our teacher and 
um, you know, I thank goodness, you know, there's, we've had hard relationships and have been through plenty of bad relationships. I was, um, divorced and then single and dating for 16, no, 13 years before I met my husband. But every one of those got me to that exact point where I got to meet my husband. Yes. And so that's you had an point. extensive learning experience. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I have, but also it all was on purpose so that I could meet Philip the day I met Philip because I was exactly ready for him. So I don't, I, they're all on, they were all on purpose. Yes. It all had to happen exactly the way it had to happen. So just, I guess my point is I have no regrets or wishes that it had been different because right. it and got me to exactly that point. If you have to be willing to be vulnerable to learn. Mm -hmm. Well, what I know is that I don't know anything and that's what's so good that I, you know, I, I mean, I, it's not that I'm stupid or I don't know anything, but I'm, I'm open to always knowing something else. Yes, there's always something new to learn, no matter right. how much we think we already know. Right, because I've been wrong many times. Well, <laughs> and sure of myself. <laughs> I mean, you think yeah. you, this is one thing you learn if you're in the, you know, personal development field is you think you, you know, have learned something and gotten to the bottom of it. And then you discover <laughs> there's something else or something exactly. more. Exactly. So, so the only way to handle that then is to just be loving. You know, that, that's what I think. So it's just, it's just a big, I have my, on my business cards, I just designed my, my uh, photography business cards and I put a battery, like a ca camera battery graphic but it's filled with three hearts and it's full, fully charged because that's really how I see myself is that I'm just, I'm seeing love through that lens and um, I'm, I'm, my battery's full for you. It's not depleted at all. And I can keep taking your photo and reflecting your beauty. And I hope, I hope you're willing to see it. The last photo shoot I did actually was based on something you, a lady, a photographer you mentioned to me that I did that unveil series. I, I liked what she did. People, I shot it in my studio and you can see on the monitor as they're done, as they're going, but at the end, I have them go through them and say which ones they like. And they would look at the monitor. This was multiple times. Oh my God, they're so beautiful. And I say, that's you. I haven't even edited it yet. All I did was point the camera at you. And you allowed me to do that. And you were soft with me because I was a comfortable space. But that is, you're totally 100% beautiful. I haven't even done anything. That's what I just, I can't, that filled my heart up so much every time they said that. Oh, they're so beautiful. I was like, I didn't even do anything. That's you. I love that. That's what I hope to do with photography and the podcast is, you know, I don't know what I hope to do with the podcast, but <laughs> I do hope that the same thing happens is that people feel safe, well, feel there's, heard, there's a, there's a term feel heard. that um, people have used. And I, I think that's something um, it's people say they're holding space. Right, right. Well, that's what I, so when I do the photography, I think I, I let you be seen. And with the podcast, I hope you're heard. And that's where I think, you know, um, yeah, so that's, I just hope, I know as the youngest of six, they would ask the sister older than me, what is Hara like? They didn't even talk to me. I mean, I literally had no voice until about 15 when she moved out. And so that's what the fact that I am doing a podcast and I went to a networking lunch today, actually, and nor I have in the past had to speak and I would turn red and start sweating. And after I spoke, I realized, oh, I didn't. And so I just think it's a lovely thing to be 53 <laughs> over myself. <laughs> and at this point, and that's why I'm, I was saying earlier that it's a natural progression. I feel very confident that I can do this and do this for others. And I'm very happy about it. Well, not that you are old because 53 is not old. I realize, yeah. But I did mention to you that uh, project that I want to do on um, changing perspectives on aging. And one of the most beautiful things about old
people is the way they are basically over themselves. They can. Exactly. That is what I love also. Although, I mean, I know some insecure older women. I happen to know some, but mostly I think the ones that aren't are, um, I'm very attracted to. I'm very attracted to anybody who's just secure in their body. You know, um, I know one woman who's very, very tall and very large, and she is so secure in herself. I'm, I'm a hundred percent attracted to her all the time. Like, I just want to know what she's saying. I want to know what she's thinking. And that's what they always say about confidence. It's not about how you look. It's about how you hold yourself. And so. I well, mean, it's the energy you put out. To be sexy. I mean, to be sexy, it's, I think I'm sexy. And then therefore you are. You don't have to look a certain way. Well, I think it, it really is cool. an energy and it can't be, it can't be faked. It's just. All right real it's who they are right right so this lady i love this lady she's just just herself a hundred percent so um we could probably talk forever but um these are meant to be fairly short so do you have one last thought on on vulnerability that you would like to leave the listeners with I, I mean, I haven't given this any thought, but I think if you could just find that little girl or boy inside you and remember, remember that person and love that person, you'll be able to find love for yourself. Great. Yeah. So um, what's the name of your podcast going to be again? See Beneath Your Beautiful. See Beneath Your Beautiful. Beneath Your Beautiful is a song by Labyrinth and it's... Um, so beautiful and it talks about i want to see your beneath your perfect um i want to climb your walls and you know get to know you better that's what that song's about and i just it makes me feel so excited inside every time i hear it so that's that's the how i came up with the name and i just want to see beneath your beautiful i'm okay with the the nitty and the gritty and the and the dirty and i still think you're beautiful and i think it makes you more beautiful to be honest Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much for uh, being brave enough to have this oh. conversation. And thank you. Um, do you want to tell the listeners how they could get a hold of you? Oh, sure. Um, my um, Hara dot photography is my website. Um, www dot Hara dot photography. All and right. H A R A. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Okay. Well, have a good rest of your day. You too. Bye. Bye.